Hi, Derek here for Tech Time. Today we are talking AI. It's mostly been lurking in the background, working behind the scenes in apps and software we've all used, like computerized photography and our phones to make every shot great. Algorithms that power travel sites to find the best deals. And for those of us who've already gone electric, self-driving cars. But now, just in the last few months, AI has come out of the shadows in the form of ChatGPT, starting the revolution that puts the power of AI in everybody's hands. Today, I have a very special guest and friend, Willie Fu, who has embraced this new tech to help you and I better understand it, learn how we can harness the power of AI to enrich our lives, and share his thoughts on what the AI future might hold. Let's go. Hi, and welcome, Willie. Thanks for joining me today on Tech Time to talk about AI, which has finally been made accessible to everyday people and potentially can really change the way we do everything. Yes, it will, and thank you for having me. Uh, this conversation, of course, started just, uh, I think I connected with you two or three weeks ago, and you asked me if I'd got onto this whole chat GPD thing, and yep. of course I haven't. <laughs> I've just been too busy just <laughs> doing other stuff. And, um, but you were so excited that it got me super interested. Mm -hmm. And when we caught up, you showed me some of the power of it. Now, I was actually very, very impressed. And which is why we have the conversation here today, because I think this information can be so powerful. And uh, I really want to know more about it. And uh, you seem to be in the know. Yeah. You, you, and you were just scratching the surface of it. Yeah. And we are it, all it just was, scratching the surface of it. Ju it's just starting. This is the, the yeah. new thing that we want to get, I mean, I've missed the last few waves of new technology. So I want to get in on this one. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's start. Yeah. Let's start off with uh, just explaining what is chat GPT. I mean, this is something that's kind of, from my perspective, I, I saw it kind of exploding on Facebook. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of people posting up things about it. Um, it seemed pretty amazing, but I, I just kind of like brushed over. It didn't really take much notice. Until uh, you, until a couple of people mentioned to me, Chat GPT, you got to check this out. Of course, you're one of the main proponents of it. So mm -hmm. tell us what what is Chat GPT and why is this become such an instant phenomenon and just like it seemed like overnight. Okay, uh, let me share a screen and uh, and the reason I want to do this is to be able to uh, I've, I've prepared some slides to lay the foundation and it's important so that we can understand its limitations and why it behaves the way it does and it does it it has some quotes and uh, let me start by uh, just giving you a very brief timeline on when AI came into view uh, in 19 it actually has been here for many many years uh, it's the, the term AI was coined back in 1950s. But it wasn't until 1997 that AI, with this supercomputer called Deep Blue, defeated the world chess champion. And that was the first time it really came to view as, hey, AI is really coming about. And I was, it got me so excited yesterday, I was doing a research. In just 10 years, the power that we have on our smartphones is the same as what the supercomputer had in 1997, in just 10 years. And and today, um, no chess players could beat the blue, uh, to could beat at the, any, any computers now. The last time a human player ever beat a computer was in 2005, and that's just within 10 years of a computer, actually, the first time a computer actually beat the world chess player. In 2011 wow. was the first time that us as public, most people and most general people came in contact with a kind of uh, AI, which is it's not true AI, but it's it's where people started realizing, hey, you can start talking to computers now. And fast forward to 2002, and last year, 2022, in 30th of November, Chat GPT was launched by a company called OpenAI. Now, uh, in five days, it reached a million users, and in and in just two months, it reached 100 million users. Uh, in contrast, TikTok took nine months and Instagram took two and a half years. That's that's a huge leap. And that's why you see wow. the viral things happening all over the internet. I'm going to show you a video. And there, there are lots of videos that have been created about chat GPT and all that. And most of them ask silly questions. But this one is impressive because it was an actual doctor that reviewed chat GPT. Okay, I'm just going to play the That video. guy's a doctor? <laughs> this guy's a doctor, yeah. So I'm just going to play the video and, and, 
and watch his videos. I hope the internet is good enough for you to see this. Holy crap, it gets a lot of the details right about how we would kind of approach this patient and a lot of how we would generate a plan for the patient for that day. And like, this looks pretty legit for a soap note. Like it's got all the things that we typically include in them. So then this person goes back and says, then when it does that, type in, make it longer and include pros and cons in the assessment and include a table of a full neuro exam with expected findings based on her chief complaint. <laughs> like, holy crap, <laughs> let me try this in. Like I've actually, I, I knew I was going to be impressed, but honestly, this is freaking insane. I definitely got to link this to my neuro colleagues because <laughs> obviously this is a neuro presentation, but like, just like it's going to include a full neuro table on this one. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what that is. So far, everything seems about the same. Let's see. A neuro exam is now coming out. And it's actually generating a table. Uh, this honestly, this note looks better than the notes that we write in the hospitals. Like, what is this table? <laughs> like, this table is beautiful. Five out of five. Okay, so uh, I just got the full lowdown. That's uh, cheat notes for a doctor. <laughs> I, I needed this when I was in med school. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's impressive that a doctor says that. And, uh, well, as we go through why chat GPT is, why, how chat GPT works, you'll understand why it does that. Okay, so first we have to understand what the GPT stands for. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, so we need to first understand what GPT stands for. Well, the G stands for generative, which means it creates it, it creates new information, it generates new information. In this case, ChatGPT is a large language model or LLM. It creates new words. It's a pre-trained model with 175 billion parameters in 2021. And you could buy one of these GPUs uh, that costs about 7,000 US dollars if you want to do it yourself. But that will take you 335 years to train up a model like ChatGPT. But what Microsoft did was it, take, it took 10,000 of these GPUs and built a supercomputer for OpenAI. And it probably took, well, the numbers varies, but some experts agree it's anywhere from a month to a couple of months, anywhere from 500,000 to millions of dollars to train up the chat GPT model. So it's not exactly, you can't update it every day. Uh, it, it, it's expensive to train and you need to do it in kind of batches. So this version is up to June 2021. And what's important to what, is sorry? 2021. Right. The current version and just to, is... Just to be clear, yeah. what is a parameter? We'll talk about parameters in a while. Okay, sure. Okay, so uh, a transformer is the important part here. And that is uh, a transformer is an AI model, and that replaces the old model, which is RNN, right? RNN, without going to the... This is probably going to be the most complex slide, but I'll try to summarize it. In 2017, Google released, Google researchers released a paper that talks about attention. And it's, it's complex, but I'll try to summarize it for you over here. So you notice uh, there's probabilities and there's positional. What it really says is that all large language models are really just advanced autocomplete engines. Okay, what it, it, and, it, 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 and the only purpose of it is trying to figure out the complex relationship between different words in a sentence. And the difference between the two is previously RNN was slow. It does things word by word. And it's always like a teacher trying to figure out, okay, student number two, you're kind of in between student number one and three, and student number four is kind of near you. And by the time it goes to the middle of a class, it kind of forgets what happens, what's the sequence in the beginning of the class. Whereas in the transformer model, the teacher says, okay, kids, everybody just look around you and figure out the position you are and who's near you. So the TLDR of it is that it's really computationally efficient. It's able to send everything in parallel. So it's, it's make, able to make use of multi-cores and multiple GPUs, and each student takes a photo of the class and runs off to one of these GPUs and cores and figures out this position, and rather than the teacher having to do it itself. Okay, got it there? Yep. Okay, so let's let's come up with a very simple example. For example, you've got Rover is A, and you get to fill in the blanks. So through its searching, its uh, language model, it may figure out, and these are just um, imaginary figures, right? But it may figure out that 20% is a dog, 12% is a robot, 9% is a jeep, and somebody on the internet said that its pet pig is a Rover. 
So it gives up, comes out of these possibilities. But it's very much dependent on context. In the previous paragraph, for example, if somebody mentioned a park, the dock may jump up by another 20%. Um, and somebody mentions park, and they jump up by another 20%. Or if somebody mentions Mars or NASA, it may be a robot, or it can be an explorer robot, or it can be a rover as a space explorer. The, the, the percentages changes based on the context of other words that comes in. Or for example, if you see land coming before rover, immediately before rover, uh, the numbers change again. So for example, if it comes out of just three possibilities, and if the 60% G, 20% is a four by four, 20%, the next word is an SUV, you literally roll the dice. It's a hundred-sided dice, and if you roll a seventy, for example, then the next word is a four by four, and it repeats this process to fill up to fill up the next word and the next word. And we kind of have autocomplete technologies in our phones and our webs on our webs on our Chrome browsers for a long time. This is just a very advanced version of uh, autocomplete engine. All right, so let's uh, let's. So, so just the, the autocomplete that you just shared there, that yeah. is, this is part of which of the technology? This is part of the... So this is essentially the basis of all large language models. It is a autocomplete engine. The transformer model just makes this very efficient. Whereas okay. it takes, a, it, it takes a, much, a lot of computing power to work out um, how these words are at first to create, to generate this model, or what we call the brain. Uh, to, it takes a lot of computing power to generate the brain, and it takes, and it's very slow to generate the answers when you need them. So- Can you just clip back to the last, the first slide with the, <clears throat> before that? Okay, so we're talking, so the last thing you just talked about was a transformer element, yep. Yep. is it? So that's yep. the, <clears throat> that's the language model, which is in context, that takes into all these accounts to work out what the next word is yeah. based on. Fact, the previous one tries to do that as well, but the transformers has made it really efficient. Okay. Yeah. But all of this is all under LLM. Yeah. When you got LLM there in the corner, this is all, yeah. that's the whole generative pre-trained transformer is the language model. Well, there are other generative transformers. There are other generative uh, AI technologies like generative art. Uh, okay, Chad gotcha. GPT okay. belongs to a language model, so it just predicts languages rather than predicting what art is or fills in different pixels to generate art. So these okay. are language models. So it's a language AI. Okay, got it. Yes, it's a language AI for large language models. And okay. what is the difference between a small and a large language? Uh, well, there's. I don't think there's a term for small language models. It's just saying that it, it literally takes in the, the, the almost the whole internet and, and there's lots of words. So that's why it's called a large language model. Okay. Okay. Uh, so OpenAI is the company that's behind this. And the interesting thing is it's founded as a nonprofit organization. And that's why it's and, and because Elon Musk was one of the founders, and he believes that Google shouldn't be the only one that's, a large company shouldn't be the only one that's controlling, and he wants to be open to everybody so that it doesn't get controlled by one company. The irony of that is, uh, after Google published its transformer model, uh, the, the direction kind of changed, and Elon Musk leaves the board saying that it's no longer open source, it's no longer open, that's the irony of it called, being called open AI. And it becomes, it changes from, changed from a non-profit company to a cat for profit company. And Microsoft injected a billion dollars into it. And with that billion dollars and Microsoft's investment and in probably it's provided supercomputer, it can now train a hundred times bigger data compared to GPT-2 and create a GPT-3 instead. And that's when it has a huge jump in its capabilities. And you've got there, <clears throat> so initially the company was its own, uh, it started with Sam Altman. It's got Amazon there. So yeah. was he part of Amazon or? No, Amazon was probably providing, well, the thing is you need a lot of computing power. So I'm assuming Amazon came in to provide that infra right, right. computer infrastructure to, to create this large language models. So it was an independent entity. It was an um, independent entity, yes, that's founded by a couple of, uh, 
couple of guys. I'm just naming three of the more prominent ones. Sam Altman right. is the founder. Um, and Google, so you're saying Google, they actually published their data on this transformer model for everybody yeah. to use. Is yes. that what? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then, uh, open AI took some of that technology. In fact, it took, took all of it. The, the whole thing. It's, okay. It's incorporated the whole. Model. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's interesting. Irony. They're, 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 <laughs> they're competitors now. <laughs> Very interesting. So the okay. technology is provided by the main competitor. Right. And and basically, um, OpenAI slash Microsoft, they have beaten Google to the finish or at yes. this milestone in terms of getting a accessible product that the public can use. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what's interesting, it's it's looking at the, the, the what component, what's the data that is used to train uh, GPT-3. If you notice this web text too, they realized that web text one was very toxic and they kind of need to, and web text is actually pulled from Reddit and there are external links coming out of Reddit. And they realized that a lot of things in there are very toxic and they kind of had to put some filters in there. We can go into this a little bit of detail later, but that's why they have to create a web text too. Okay. Let's just go into that in a little bit more detail later, but in 2021, uh, it released Dal E, and that's where it created. When you see all those people creating the portraits of themselves, that's created by Dal E. And uh, well, technically, the technology is provided by Dal E, and some companies just link up to Dal E's API to create those portraits. Hang on, so sorry, Dal E is another type of technology that's image processing. I broke. I broke you broke off a little while. <clears throat> sorry, Dal E is another technology. DALL-E is brings... like a generative AI, is gener is a generative image technology, yes. Okay, and it actually converts text to image. It's not actually, because I see all these people online posting all these fabulous images of themselves. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> but I assume that has been created by them submitting a bunch yes. of portraits, and yes. then it creates it from that. So, so this is different? It is based <clears throat> on this. So what happens is, Lenser was is the company that, that, that was one of the companies that went viral that everybody started using. And what Lenser did was it gets you to upload a photo, and this is it's called an image prompt as well. So based on its image prompt, and then Lenser has its own text prompts. For example, Lenser's text prompt will be create uh, generate sixteen superhero images variations based on this image. Right. And then sends that text prompt it together with the image to Dali to generate images out and it costs them probably a couple of cents and they charge $12 for it. Okay. So Lens actually uses the Dali technology. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Now yeah. just, I'm just curious, just going back to um, this training data. So I think yeah. it's important to note that basically chat GPT creates or generates this content based on what's already out there. And what's already out there is what's on the internet. So it's- it, It's based it's, on what's available on the internet. For example, Common Crawl is actually a company that has been crawling the internet and provides <laughs> data for everybody for free. And uh, OpenAI takes Common Crawl as a big chunk of its data and they don't do it themselves. Common Crawl has already done the crawling over the last I don't know how many years. I think it's the last seven years on uh, this stage. Right. So basically, all of this um, generation is based on this global information network that's on the internet. That's how it, it creates this content, it's based on yes. what's out there. Mm. And you've mm. mentioned that because some of that information is mm. toxic, such as the stuff from Reddit, so there's some level of filtering as well yes. that helps remove data that may not be real or actual or true. Okay, I've actually that... done that. I've actually have a separate slide to show that. So oh, okay, for example, cool. this is this is common crawl, <clears throat> whereby it takes in it's it's been crawling the, the web for seven years. Uh, it's it's indexed uh, quite a bit of the, the web with 40 over languages. So chat GPT does, doesn't just do one language, it's it's pretty multi-language capable. And web text two, when they had web text one, they found that web text one had a very high toxicity score. And that's why they created web text two with filtered text 
and it has to have a couple of votes um, where and a couple of other filters to make sure to clean up to sanitize the data i'm kind of curious what they label as toxic data <laughs> <laughs> well the internet is pretty much toxic <laughs> and, and, and well toxic people tend to have a louder voice and they tend to say a lot more uh the the, the, the more the calmer people probably are less vocal on the internet so generally data on the internet tends to be skewed a little bit right involved. gotcha right let's go okay. back to <clears throat> this okay so in, and in 20, 2022 they, they came out of a chat gpt 3.5 which is a fine-tuned data from 2021 now it's fine-tuned because there are other ways of improving your data like with human input a human input would just say okay is this result better or that result better and it feeds that data back into it and tunes the data um and they re and they realize that they want to release it public, but it's not good enough to release it public because it's still a little bit complex to use. There are a lot of options to tweak. There are a lot of toggles to, to fix. There are a lot of numbers to tweak. So they, they kind of package it up. They put rules. They put safeguards and give and came out something that's a chat bot that makes it very easy for people to interact with, and that's called ChatGPT. And that was released in 30th of November, 2022. Gotcha. Right? And... And in just uh, just a month or so, Microsoft decided to, invite, to invest, seeing that it has grown so fast, invested 10 more billion into it, and they released ChatGPT Plus at the end of January for 20 US dollars per month. And Microsoft packaged its own version of uh, from GPT 3.5 as well, and created Bing.com Chat. Uh, it's currently on the wait list. I'm on the wait list. I don't have it yet, but some people in the US has, has have it already. I've got a video showing that later as well. So what's the, um, okay, so firstly, uh, why did they Oops, start you. asking a subscription? Why, it was uh, free, when it was released in November, it was free, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then why did they start offering a subscription? What was the impetus or the drive behind that? Was that always the plan or? Well, I guess the thing is, the, the, when ChatGPT launched, there were so many users that it always got congested. So I'm, I'm kind of assuming people would kind of request for a paid plan whereby it's there's at least a, a, a guarantee of availability. And they kind of need to make money from that as well. So imagine if a million, I don't, I don't know numbers now, I haven't checked, but if a million people has registered for this, that's like 20 million per month uh, of revenue back. Now, remember... To run the service, it costs them $3 million a month of operational costs just to run uh, the service. So it's a way of making money, recouping investment back, and it's a way of letting the people who are willing to pay use it as well. Right. So because it was so popular, a lot of the times you'd go onto this thing and you just wouldn't be able to access it. Is that what was yep. happening? Yep. Yep. And how long would you have to wait before you could actually, like, ask the question or ask it to do what you want it to do uh it's not it's where you can get into the server number one number right. two if, if you can get into the server the firstly the rest because there's so much users the responses are slower as well right okay, uh, gotcha. so by providing a plus subscription it could have a, a faster response and the the free service is still there it's just not the priority and it's the responses will be much slower uh, also, if you ask a couple, the, there's a kind of a limit of how many questions you can ask per hour. We don't know the actual limit. It's probably tweaked based on uh, how busy the server is. And chances are you'll kind of have a timeout. So after a while, after asking a couple of questions, it kind of times out and um, you can't ask questions anymore. It kind of breaks halfway. So it's not viable for people who really need to use it to to have it available to them. So that's where business users pay. And twenty dollars a month isn't much. It, no, it's it's pretty cheap. I mean, yeah. considering what it can do. Considering what it can do, it it makes somebody five to ten times more efficient. Uh, it's it's easy for a business to justify twenty dollars a month to to improve the efficiency of just the staff. And what is the what is what is Bing.com chat? What is how is that different from ChatGPT? 
Oh, I guess so, you don't know because we haven't tried. I haven't. Well, no, I kind of, <laughs> I kind of know what's into it because of a clue. Somebody has posted a video, and I kind of have an idea what what chat what Bing has done. But let's talk about that later when we when we take. Okay, a sure. <laughs> okay, so it, in its current version, Chat GPT has its limitations. So, firstly, it's a twenty twenty one version, and it cannot connect to the internet. That means it can't fact check. And when it's wrong, it can sound confidently wrong. It's quite funny when it does that, actually. Uh, it, it's got its biases as well, as we talked about it. The internet is inherently biased. Toxic people has a, has a louder voice. And because there's this human reinforcement portion of it, the human reinforcement can introduce biases as well. For example, if the people that are doing the human re reinforcement saying that this answer is bad and that answer is more left-wing, uh, more pro-left, uh, it, it introduces that bias. And, and this current version... Uh, we have done research on it to figure that it, current chat GPT is very left biased, very pro Biden, very anti Trump. Gotcha. It's got a limited memory as well. So, it, so what chat GPT is, is it's a brain with this 175 billion parameters, but it's got its temporary memory for every user or, or for every chat session. And this memory is. 4,000 tokens or approximately 3,000 words. Okay, so you kind of ask what is the difference between parameters and tokens, right? Uh, let's jump. Parameters. Yeah, what is a token? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so think of parameters as, jump back into this. Okay, think of parameters as a weight. So there's 175 billion parameters and but there's only about 170,000 English words. Uh, what a parameter is, it's a weightage between, think of it, it's just connection between words. It figures out the connection between words and its weightage to other words. For example, Rover is a dog, so the dog has a very high weightage to Rover. And a token is just a way to encode a word. So, one word is approximately one token is approximately four characters, but uh, what you should remember is four thousand tokens and three thousand words because that's the limit you have per chat per inquiry per session. So just remember three thousand words. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm still confused about how this relates to the thing. So I guess when we actually <laughs> look at doing, yeah, you can think of tokens as words. But not exactly one-to-one. Okay. -one. It's token, uh, just think of 3,000 words, and the parameters are the way that words interlink to each other. Yep, I get the parameters. Yep, understand mm -hmm. that, the yeah. weightage. Um, but I'll wait till we get more into the conversation yeah. and well, see how this works. Is, to... it, it's not only English. So it, it could be Chinese, it's many other languages yep. as well. And they are all encoded into something that's a lot more efficient for AI models or... Uh, natural nat language processing to, to handle, and these are called tokens in, in the AI world. Okay. All right, let me jump back to its limitations. Well, okay, so it's got limited memory. And the, the thing to remember of just, all just to put that in language sorry. models is, is as an open, autocomplete engine, and currently it's got a lot of knowledge but not as much intelligence. So you think of it as a kid which has read through, it's, it's a child prodigy which has read through tons of books, but it has got little idea of how to process those information yet. Gotcha. Just back on the, sorry, the last slide that you had there, the, just to give a context, when you say limited memory of 4,000 tokens, how how do you put that into something that a normal person can relate to? What how much information is that? It's three thousand words. So just remember oh, okay. three thousand words, and that is actually shared between your answer and your and your question, your prompt. The prompt is called a question. Uh, the, the question is called a prompt. So so that, that means whatever answer it provides, it cannot provide more than three thousand words. Is that it can, the output it cannot, cannot be remember? It cannot remember more than three thousand words. It can remember what it has popped in in the past, and to to shape its next answer. 
but it cannot remember more than it'll try to remember as much as it can to a limit of four thousand tokens, which is a problem. Gotcha. Okay. So if you're having so it's like if you're having a conversation with somebody, and if I had a limit of a hundred words, then after around five or seven minutes, the, yeah, you cannot forget anything before that is thing. going to be like forgotten, and yeah. only the most recent one hundred words that was spoken can be yeah. used. Yeah, that means okay, you gotcha. may need to okay. remind it. So you may need to remind it occasionally of the the initial. Uh, rules that if you've set it rules before that, you kind of need to remind it if it if it may kind of forget the rules and it kind of need to remind what rules that you set in the beginning. Okay, okay, right, that helps. All right. Okay, so there, there, it's it's currently has tons of mistakes, but I won't be surprised by this at all. So, for example, Chat GPT isn't very good at math, and it became a kind of a laughing stock. So what it does is, because as long as you understand it's an autocomplete engine, you kind of understand why it does this. It kind of, it, this answer is probably seen before, but not in this exact form. It's probably seen a 400, it probably sees a 3, it sees a 60,000. And that's the closest answer it has. And that person has a 60 in there and probably without the 5,000. And this is what it has seen before. It kind of autocompletes it this way. But then okay. again, when I ask it this question, 170, what's 100? I literally typed this into chat GPT and it gave me this answer. And I, I kind of had to fact check it to, to enter into Google to make sure that it's the same answer. And I figured out how come it got this answer correct then. Then I realized that 175 billion is a very common number because of chat GPT 3. It's, it's a very commonly known to have 175 billion parameters. And the number of words in the English language is 170,000. So I'm not the first person who has done this. A lot of people have probably asked this question before, and that's how it came up with this exact answer. So, and it's done quite a bit of mistakes before as well. And for example, uh, this is the this is when Google's Bar AI launched to the public, and this mistake, uh, a lot of news probably hyped it up by saying that this mistake probably caused Google's stock price to drop by a hundred billion dollars by, by by a huge number. I can't remember the number. And it's not surprising how it came up with this. For example, if you take a look at NASA's website, okay, uh, and if you realize that it's looking for this word first, if I do a quick search on this first, first was mentioned seven times in this website. So if this was an autocomplete engine, and if you take a look at it and says, uh, recent discoveries made by James Webb Space Telescope, it'll kind of sees JWSC, and it, has, it took a lot of very first pictures of other things, but when it does the autocomplete, it does a percentage and the dice roll the wrong way. The f and it probably wrote a planet there. When the planet, and the planet is a logical next word, it's just not very factual. But the dice just rolled the wrong way. Okay, so basically what you're saying is when it generates answers, it's looking it's looking at the available information on the internet. It's not looking at the, the current avail information available on the internet. It's looking at what it has seen before. How is that different? The information uh, that's there and what it's seen, seen before is, is not, not the same thing? Uh, well, number one, the information is not updated. Number two, it's the, the words has already been broken down. It's no longer the words as it is. All the words are is left with relationships between words. For example, uh, planet and solar system tends to be fairly near each other. So, and planet is very close to, and JD, JWST is very, is a, has a very close relationship with a planet. So when he sees JWST, the, the, the planet's probability of planet appearing becomes very high. Right. So basically it's looking at patterns that have already been established on the World exactly. Wide Web. And the yeah. longer those patterns or those sequences or those connections have been there, the stronger it equates the probability. So even if new information comes that changes that order, it has very little effect because it's looking at everything in totality and what the highest probability is. Yes. Would that be right? And the, and the thing is, it, it, number one, it does not know what's factual. It does, even if it right. sees fake information, it can't tell if it's fake information. So if there are sure. lots of, a lot of this fake information on the internet, it will literally spit that out. So basically, it's a popularity contest. It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, if you look at it that way, yeah. 
right. Okay. Cool. Yep. Right. So it's an autocomplete engine. It's not a math engine. That's why it's failing at this math thing. And it's an easy problem to solve. All you need to do is to link it to a math engine. And this is, I think, what Bing Chat has done because this YouTuber, uh, this very popular YouTube channel, has tested it out and asked this. The YouTube channel is LTT uh, for Linus Tech Tips. It asked how many LTT backpacks will fit in the trunk of a Tesla Model Y. Okay, this is a video again. And if, yeah. can you see it now? If not, I'll send you the link. I thought the dimensions for the backpack are in picture form. Ser searching. Searching for that. Now it's searching up the backpack dimensions. Shut up! This is a tricky question. Man, oh my God, go. the natural like language of it have Look different at this. shapes and dimensions. Based on some rough estimates, I will try to answer That's it. That's insane! Whoa. That's actually nuts! It's, it's still going. Will depend on how flexible and compressible the backpacks are and how well they fit into the corners and curves of the trunk. Based on oh, some videos of the Model Y trunk. Uh, no. Shut up! It can fit about five to seven standard carry-on suitcases which have similar dimensions and capacity. Holy. Which is accurate. That statement is real. Shit. That's crazy i don't know who made that tweet but that was brilliant because i had watched demos i had watched tons of stuff up until that point up until i saw that tweet from whoever made that on our team so big oh, the class. social team's amazing amazing shout out arthur and arjun i didn't realize it was that capable and if we have any new people on that team i haven't met yet sorry the various steps it had to go through yeah not only did it, it even showed it work yes it searched the original question realized there isn't really an answer for this out there yet decided i'm going to look up the dimensions of the backpack i'm going to look up the dimensions of the trunk i'm going to realize that this trunk even though i have dimensions and whatnot is going to have weird curves and stuff which is going to throw it off quite a bit um i, I know that's in dimensions don't worry about it i said that poorly but it's going to have weird curves and stuff that's going to throw it off what can this backpack relate to oh a standard size of luggage is extremely similar let's use that because there's other references to how that can fit in this the, blah, 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 blah. This was full thought process, man. Okay. That's crazy. Okay. Okay, but, but how up to the minute is it? I like lttstore.com, but I only wear tracksuits. Do they make a tracksuit? All right, so um, <clears throat> just watch the video. So basically... It, this video you're showing just to show that it actually has a thought process. It's not just regurgitating information or just reprocessing content out there. It's also actually thinking. Yep. 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 It All right. That's like the that. logic part. Okay, cool. With the math. Okay. So it's complete. Yeah. So, so all, all you need is to put a logic engine and just to start linking various engines together. So you need a logic engine to kind of be at the front of it. And to figure out if you need an autocomplete engine or when do you need to call in a math engine. If it looks like you're looking for a, a math answer, you need to call up a math engine, not an autocomplete engine. And so is this where chat so this is the state where chat GPT is at the moment? It has these. No, chat GPT is only an Sorry, what was that that video that was shown was using what technology? It was oh, using right, okay. Bing's so that was Bing's the of, the so, Yes. So I think that what Bing and ChatGPT could easily do this as well. Just uh, math, math engines have been around for a long, long, long time. So they could easily just figure out a pattern and say, okay, is this a math question? Then pull in a math engine to help gotcha. with this answer. All right. Now, <laughs> the thing is, it, it's more than that. At this stage, I think Microsoft's version is just linking an autocomplete logic and math engine, but there are tons more. What if you start linking all the various engines together? And a lot of these engines have been around. A physics engine, for example, is, is Unreal. Uh, Unity, they're all, the game engines are all physics engines. Um, Microsoft has a coding engine, which is kind of based on GPT 3.5, but fine-tuned towards code. 
but it's got no way of checking itself right now. And all it needs to do is to provide an environment for it to test its code. And we call this a sandbox. And just if, if once that happens within a day, and remember computers can do things like a million times a, a second or a minute. And just within a day, that coding capability will just grow by a thousand times. And there are verification engines available. Uh, it just needs to improve. And this needs to just verify a, a, fact check, a fact check engine, for example. You send it an information and it can spit out a you a value and say this is 90% true. Uh, discovery engines are what uh, vet medicine engines use. Uh, vaccines, for example, um, they are used to discover new things instead of versus the autocomplete. It just does things which has been done before. In discovery engines, you need to discover stuff which hasn't been done before. So it's it's a kind of a permutation engine to be able to look for new possibilities to find new stuff. Um, ethics engine hasn't been created. Well, I, I've seen one example of ethics, somebody's attempt to create an ethics engine to be able to figure out. And the, the idea of it is you can't just have one guiding principle like do no harm. For example, if what if the computer figures out that humans are the one creating harm is less harmful to kill off all humans. So it kind of needs to have a couple of uh, uh, parameters to guide its ethics. Uh, and creative art engines are around, like uh, DALI is an art engine. Uh, there are other art engines available as well. So all you need to do is to start linking these engines together to start seeing huge improvements, and that forms mm. its intelligence. Amazing. Right? What if, uh, why don't we start, go, since we, are, we see some, the art here, why don't we start showing you some of the art engines sure. and what it can do? Um, <clears throat> okay, yeah, let's have a look at the art, art stuff. Okay, so there are a couple of art engines. Uh, the DALI is, I didn't mention DALI here, but DALI is one of them, but one of those are getting very popular and having a lot of attention now are Midjourney and Stable Diffusion. The newer ones are Blue Willow and Leonardo AI, and Leonardo AI is stated as the Midjourney killer. So if you think of it, a lot of people are benchmarking against Midjourney because it's, it's been creating a so lot where of... So where does Lenza fit into <laughs> this? Lenza is... Well, I didn't mention one, but I should have put the first one as Dali, which is kind of the, <clears throat> the one that is pro the engine that's provided for a okay, lot sorry, of Okay, sorry, so these are all engines. Mm -hmm. They're not the... These are all... Then again, the, some of these could be using Dali's okay. engine. So these are the apps. So these are front the end front-end apps. Okay, end they could apps. be using Dali. Yeah. Some of them could be using DALI. Some of them could be creating on their own. Okay. Okay. So, for example, this is Leonardo AI. And Leonardo AI, there's a gallery of images which you can click. And when you click on one of these images, it'll show you what kind of prompts are used to create this image. And you notice there are negative prompts. These are the prompts. There are negative prompts as well. What you don't want to happen. Uh, so you could literally copy the prompt, and for example, I can copy this prompt and if I insert some new things in there, for example, I want a city background, I want futuristic, and I want a night scene, it could generate, and I click on generate, this takes up tokens. Uh, in this case, the Leonardo AI has five, 250 tokens a day, and it could generate... Okay, so now I kind of understand what tokens are. Tokens are basically, um, that is how much, how many processes it can do. Is that yeah, it, it is of work it's a and a, 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 uh, a measurement of how much work it's a memory that can currency. be done. You can, you can call it a, a, a currency in terms of okay. memory. How much memory it All right, uses. So, in this case, in, in this art, it's taken this much of memory to generate this art. In LMM's case, uh, a token is right, gotcha, kind of okay. a word. Yeah. So this is this is all okay, but pure AI. It's all fictional. It's this is AI. Yeah, yeah. So what generative AI does is it, it, it learns from all the input of publicly available images and it kind of mathematically formulates a way to say how do you mathematically generate a face? How do you mathematically generate this person's style of art? And when it looks at these words, it mathematically figures out how to generate. Okay. 
So it doesn't really store the pictures itself. It just stores so mathematical representations. Does it cost money to use these AI generators, these image generators? Do they, is Sorry? it free? Yeah, is it free it or they money? charge? Okay, so DALI, DALI charges for it based on the num, num, amount of tokens that's required to generate things. And uh, so different sizes will require, larger sizes will require more tokens, for example. Uh, and a lot of these newer AIs to generate traction, it gives a couple of images of, it gives X number of tokens for free. So you can generate a certain number of uh, images. For example, Leonardo AI gives 250 tokens a day. Mid Journey gives a kind of a limit before you've got to pay for Well, 250 it. tokens, what can that get you? <laughs> Uh, so each image gives you two tokens. It takes up two tokens. This image takes up two tokens, or rather a set of four oh, images. Oh, wow, okay, takes so that's quite tokens. a lot. So that's a few, but think, remember, you, you, it's, it's, not, it's never a one shot. You never get your answers. Right, okay, you so you've got to iterate a few times, okay. so you're going to use, right. You need right, to iterate gotcha. a couple of times. Yeah, you need to keep, keep tweaking your, your prompts. You need to, if something comes out the way you don't want, you, you're, you're kind of fitting in what you don't want. So, for example, if you see a pro, poorly drawn face, you kind of fit in the negative prompt to try to massage the engine wow, okay. to give you what you want. So, okay. So, it, it comes up with weird things as well. For example, it frequently comes up with, it's got, prop, it's got trouble figuring out fingers oh. and legs and limbs. So, for example, <laughs> you notice the number okay. of fingers it has there. It's got five fingers it and what's the thumb? Okay, and this is the less obvious ones, but sometimes it comes out with these. And this is the actual uh, result I came out with when I didn't include the knight. It came bones. up with three legs. <laughs> so it comes out with kind of four answers. It comes out with four answers, four images. You kind of pick your favorite image and say iterate okay. on this image. Okay, uh, so it's a lot. It's it's. It's a lot more complex to do this, right. and this current generation isn't it's very It's kind of just a bit of fun. I was just thinking this is limit. kind of a, it could be a great way just to generate <laughs> stock images for your business or whatever, but obviously right now it seems like it is a little bit tedious. No, it can. You just have to, it, it just, it's, it, it, you just have to yeah. go through a couple of steps. You've got to throw away the bad images. And how, and how long does it normally take to so generate the image after you put in the prompts? Now you can, it takes about a minute. It takes about a minute to come okay. up with about four images. Okay, so for so I want to talk about the ethics of it. I, I don't do AI art because uh, number one is a bit controversial because it literally has to take in actual training data from actual artists. And that's why a lot of artists are, are unhappy about it that they're not being paid to be for the AI training data to be used. But come to think of it, what do humans actually do? If, if, you, if you study art in school, literally you are training data from the artists that have come before you. Uh, the teachers are looking at, okay, this is the way uh, Leonardo da Vinci does it. This is the way Michelangelo does it. And you're kind of learning how to do it, imitate them, and kind of then generating ideas mm -hmm. and styles of your own. That's not that much different from how AI does it. It's just done, it's doing it in such a large scale that makes a, lo a lot of yeah. artists unhappy. Uh, so a couple of years ago, this artist came to me and says that she wants to draw a portrait of me. And after a couple of discussions, I told her that, well, I, this is a photo that I took and it's quite a representative photo of my work. And so she went back and, in, and she took three months to come out of this right. oil cool. painting. And this was done in three months. I took this image, I fed this back into Leonardo, and in just one minute, it generated this out. And the prompt I gave it, I think, was create a superhero version of this image. And that generated in one minute. Of course, there are other misses as well. <laughs> the, the first version was quite bad, and I didn't specify the ratio of it. So it came out with square versions. It didn't look like it. Some of it looked cartoonish. So I kind of had the next version of I say, okay, I want the ratio to be six by nine. This is a uh, nine by 16. Uh, you know what would be interesting? This. It would be to actually use the original image you had of the girl and, and feed your image yeah. and say, make an oil painting of that and see what it comes up with. 
Yeah, interesting. <laughs> Let me try that. Maybe you should try that next. You notice, you notice how it interpreted this building, this part over here. Yeah, it yeah. was initially just black. And yeah, it that's very nice. The buildings over here. <laughs> it included lightning, lightning uh, symbols in. And this was one of them that kind of hit the hands. So you don't see the awkward right. limbs uh, or hand. Mold. You look a bit robotic as well. Um, weird stuff here. Yeah. Okay, so and there, in this case, it provided me a couple of options as well. For example, I can unzoom this, which is a beta technology. You can zoom out and see right. what's surrounding it. Uh, this costs one token. You can remove the background and cost another token. You can upscale the image and it costs another token. I see you've been... So in this case, uh, your uh, this token, 250 tokens, lasts for 24 hours yeah. and it resets in a certain number of times. Sounds like a lot of fun. All right. <laughs> It, it is fun. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite frustrating, though. You, you do have got to... It's a lot more important to... Um, the prompts are a lot more important. You need to... It's not just natural language now. You notice everything is in kind of keywords over here. You kind of... You need to give it keywords. It's not a full right. natural <laughs> language processing AI yet, which uh, chat GPT is. So these are called prompts, and the, the skill to create this is called prompt engineering. Let me jump to prompt engineering then. Um, let me see prompt engineering. So <clears throat> prompt engineering is the skill of crafting an input to deliver a desired result from a generative AI. Uh, the way to prompt a, an art AI is very different from prompting a natural language AI like ChatGPT. So it does a couple of things. Like for example, you could generate tables. Uh, let me should we try? In. Should we try doing something actual... on the on the language side so it can yeah, understand let's, the let's language? That. Since that's no. uh, what we started with. Let's, let's do that, and let me just. Ooh, my mouse disappeared. Okay, so let's come out of a new chat. So this is ChatGPT. I'm subscribed to it. Uh, so I'm on ChatGPT Plus. It's a faster model over here. It's up to the, it's default for speed. Whereas if you are using the free model, uh, it uses the legacy model and it's much slower. So what ChatGPT is good for is to generate tables. For example, uh, generate a table of technologies which have shaped shaped mankind. And I want to give an example of a table, like for example, uh, time period. Time period, technology, and jobs replaced. Okay, take a, take a little while to think, and it spits out this. So it's, it's great. At, I love it to use it to generate these kind of tables. Wow. Right, uh, you kind of you kind of need to give it a little bit of context as well. Like for example, if you wanted to, let me create a new chat. So for example, you run a parkour business, so you can give it a couple of like for example, I can say uh, generate a table of names for, and that's where you provide context names for a parkour school for kids and uh, give it a little bit more detail than what you want. For example, I want to have name and you may want to have a tagline. Uh, give 50 examples. You could give it 200 examples if you want, as long as it's within the 300, 3,000 uh, word or 4,000 token limit. You could give 50 examples. Uh, keep the names to three words or less, perhaps. So this is combining, give it X number of examples, generate tables or generate a list if you don't want a table. Or, okay, you can ask it to stop generating. Or if you don't like this or if it's, it's misunderstood, and you realize that it can give you a different response. Like for example, you notice the first one was lead kids and free runners. If you regenerate the response, Oh, in this case, it came out in the, the same one. Let me see if, it, if I stop generating, if the answers are the same. In this case, it was about the same. 
but you could notice that the, the way that it answers is it may be slightly different. Like for example, the first time, it, second time it says sure, the first time it didn't answer right. in the same way. So you could, it, it, it will, remember the random number generator is literally rolling a dice. It will not give the same answer each time. And that is based on something called temperature. So in, uh, in, in, in chat GP 3.5, before you package up, there's, there's a, there's a slider called the temperature. If you slide the temperature all the way to zero, it becomes deterministic. Every answer will turn out to be the same. So right now, the temperature is set at 0 0.7 for chat GPT, and it kind of gives you some different answers. Otherwise, the answer will be the same every single time. So remember, sometimes you give it the wrong answers. If you don't like it, regenerate your response, and you can look at the different answers that it gives. So when you say deterministic, it means it will give you the same answer all the time. What, what's, the, what's the other end of the scale called? It's totally random. You You're call it totally, totally random. <laughs> <laughs> and you you can't you probably can't get it to give you consistent answers. You'll go all so. What's the, the value? What's the value of shifting so that probably, from getting a consistent oh, result? Okay, so hold on, let me let me, <clears throat> let me phrase it another way. If you give it a value of one, it won't even look at your prompt. Remember, it's an autocomplete engine based on your prompt. So if it has a value of one, it's going to be totally random. It's probably going to come up with no, totally nonsensical sentences that doesn't link to each other very well. And it doesn't really. Okay, so I part. guess uh, analogy to like real life would be that if you go for zero, you're going to go for the safest, most predictable type of an answer. Whereas if you go for something more totally well, random on that side of the scale, it's going to be more left of center, slightly more original, um, more variety. In a way, in a way. So if you think of it, the, in a in a lang in the language model in its uh, in its brain, it's already got fixed weights from this. Um, the, the it's got already a fixed relationship between this word and this word. So you can mathematically calculate what's the most probable sentence structure, and it'll give you that every time you set a temperature. Right. Whereas if you if you if you increase it then those weights matter a bit less i guess the weights between the words and the relationships yeah or rather there's a, 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 yeah. a little bit more randomized it's not going to depend so much on those num on the percentages and gives more uh yeah free will into it i guess <laughs> in a way okay in cool. a way yep yep so so a lot of times it's i like to give it for example you could give it uh, I, I, we ask you to give it X number of examples. You can ask you to give it a role. For example, you are an expert SEO. Uh, you are a SEO expert with 30 years of experience. So that gives it a role. And you could ask you to write a... Uh, no, no, hold on. Before this, I want to. I should have given it numbers. So instead of this, I want to give it uh, give it numbers and uh, limit to ten instead. Okay. So when you give it numbers, it makes it easy to refer to. So in this case, it didn't do it in a table. Now it just gives it numbers. So I want the next step. I may want to say you are a SEO expert with 30 years experience, write SEO copy for number five. So by giving it numbers, it makes it easy for you to refer to. You could say, Okay, I like uh, I don't like number <coughs> six. I don't like number six and nine. Remove that, and that can help you to create curate a list. Okay, so and then it comes the negative prompts. You could you could say uh, you could say. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Hello. Okay. 
So you could say, don't do certain things, for example. Um, <clears throat> don't use long sentences. Keep words simple for kids. And then notice what I did. I, I changed it and I used save and resubmitted that same uh, that, that, that prompt. So there are different ways to regenerate, to come up with an answer. You can regenerate the response, or you can go back and you can resubmit the question. Or sometimes if it doesn't work, you will just need to start a new chat. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty impressive. So basically what we've done is we've just asked a question. It's given an answer, and then we can modify it based on our different requirements, whether it's yeah, yeah, and I guess that's that's what a lot of people what a lot of people misunderstand is when they first go to Chat GPT, they will literally ask the same question. They will literally treat it as Google. They ask the same question and figure, hey, I can do this on Google as well. But they are not realizing the next step of it, which is the ability to iterate, the ability to modify the questions. Well, we could ask it, so I could say, generate a table to show the different between searching on Google and chat GPT. Give them numbers. So it's, it's very good for idea generation. It's very good to help you uh, even curate stuff. Uh, I'll show you one example that I did later. Actually, I, I should show you now. So I'm going to show you this first. Uh, ba -bum -bum -bum. It is. OK, so. So for example, I want to come out with this. I wanted it to come out with this list of uh, platforms that has scripting languages. All right, and in order to do that, uh, let me see where it was. Here. Okay, cool. So it keeps a record of every chat you've ever had. Yeah, it does. It does. Okay, so. I initially started with give me a list of popular software that supports a scripting language that chat GPT can write code for, generate a table. I kind of gave an example. So for example, I thought of the first three. I haven't thought of the rest. I know there's a lot, but you could come out of the table yourself, but it takes a long time to do it. So I just asked it to generate a table. Oh, I realized that there was a first question. Uh, I think this gave a mistake or I timed out. So I, oops, so I, this was the second uh, or I think maybe it, it didn't give me the answer I want. Uh, so I wanted a table instead. So I added generate a table and I gave it two examples. Right. So that's shaping it to give me what I want. So it gave me this list. And then I said, okay, kind of Google it. And it's missing out a lot of things. So I said, okay, give me more examples. And I just added in some examples that I want in there. Okay, spat out a list of things with a lot more examples. And then I want to reorder the list based on popularity of the software and keep the list to 20. Uh, it reorganized it. And uh, and I wanted to rename this first column to popularity instead and rename Apple Works. I want to just tweak it. rather than I could eventually just copy it and paste it and eventually modify it, but I'm kind of lazy. I want to, I wanted to give the, uh, the, the, the table as the way I can just copy and paste it. So I kind of renamed Apple work as just Apple pages, numbers, keynotes, uh, it regenerates the thing out, realize that windows and Mac is not in there, edit it in, it's not at the top. So I asked it to put it to the top, etc. So after a couple of iterations, it comes up with this. And this took me about maybe 15 minutes to 
generate these answers versus doing my research, looking at all of that, figuring out what scripting language it uses and so on. Okay. So the interesting okay. thing is, yeah, software automation. So right now, ChatGPT can actually write code as well. Yes, ChatGPT is actually very good for writing code. Well, not very good because all it does is because it's an autocomplete engine, it looks at all the codes and based on what you ask, if somebody has written it before, there's a good chance they give you code chunks that are usable, but may not work all together at once. Right. Okay. So it's good to get a draft copy of some code and then you need someone that knows yeah, code to actually yeah. comb through it and clean it up. <clears throat> yes, but remember, we talked about the coding engine just now. It's got no way to test mm. its code. All it needs is an environment to actually test its code, and it can actually improve by leaps and bounds. Yeah. Okay, so there are a couple of examples over here. Like, for example, in this case, uh, there's an extension. I'm using an extension to Google Chrome. So this here, for example, is a Google Chrome extension that I added on that I could just ask it to write something. In this case, this was literally me uh, creating a, uh, a, a record, a, a speech, text to, a speech to text button so I could put a record button over here. It doesn't work now because the interface has changed. But uh, so that I could speak to it rather than typing my, my prompt out. Oh, you're trying to do that. You're trying to add that functionality to chat GPT. Catch GPT, yes. So I could literally hack. I'm so, uh, I, I, I was I, I did it so much that I just wanted to talk to it. I'm surprised I haven't actually project. got that built in. <laughs> that why is that well, why is that not actual it. chat? <laughs> why do I have to still type? What's going on? <laughs> the, 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 the thing is, the interesting thing is, there are a lot of people who have actually done uh, different interfaces to that. I could easily write. Uh, a, a kind of a, a, a different website and frame, put a frame to ChatGPT and send that text into ChatGPT if I wanted to. Hmm. Yeah. So, okay. so basically, um, okay. So let's let's talk about how how is this useful for? Let's talk about personal life and work. Like, how is this useful for everyday people in a regular? I mean, just just in life. Can can I use this? to help me in my personal life? Or is this mostly, you think, just for work uh, improvement? No, you can use it in personal life. Um, you could ask it to generate a, let, okay, so for personal, let's try this, okay? So let's start a new chat. Actually, can I do like travel itineraries? I wanna go on a 10 day holiday under two and a half thousand dollars. I was just about to show okay. you. <laughs> I was just about to show you. It might have just- Cause I hate organizing <laughs> travel. It'd be great if everything just organized. Recommended accommodation, cheapest accommodation places. Can it book it for me? That would be awesome. Can it be my travel no, agent? No, not yet. <laughs> hey, you know what? You know what? Remember we talked about the linking part? So eventually, if it links to a booking yeah, engine, yeah. It then can. it will be able to. That's the future. So it just yeah, the future will, that, that's amazing. Yeah. The, the, the thing is, the booking engines already exist. Yeah. They're, They're just, just not connected yet. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, for example, where where do you like to travel to? Uh, let's try somewhere new. Let's say Nepal. To Nepal. Okay. Uh, give it a little bit of context and, and personality. For example, what do you like? Outdoor activities. I, I like to travel. Like. Hiking. Yep. Travel. Like. Sorry. Yep, I like to that? travel. Like. Uh, hiking. Yeah, kind of a list over here and it's say okay um break it down into a table day by day day itinerary cost that's cool what that is, no that's wrong <laughs> What? What's so wrong? With the cost. See here? That doesn't look right. What about airfare? <laughs> Include is... airfare cost from Singapore. Airfare cost from Singapore. Uh, give me a day break from hiking. In the middle with massage. Are there 
Hamburg, Mainz, Dodgers, and Nepal. Hello? We didn't give the FF from Singapore at first. Um, day zero should include flight from Singapore and cost. There. So you kind of massage the answer based on what you need. Did you forget my massage? Yeah, it didn't include. So it didn't it didn't follow my exact instructions. So you may need to remind it. Uh, mm. or give it a bit more specific instructions. Uh, give me a break. Uh to take out day eight. Give me a massage on day five. Uh, let me see if it's intelligent to do it. So I want to take out Landrup to Dampus and see if it does it. Nope, it didn't follow what I... Oh, it does. Enjoy a massage in the evening. But it still did Landrup. So it, it kind of follows... But not exactly what you want. Sometimes you yeah. may need to remind it of the negative problem. Like find a different way of <laughs> asking it. All right. So, what other things can do you think that this is useful for for just personal day to day living? Uh, you could ask it to translate stuff. Uh, for example, I could. My my daughter likes to create stories. <laughs> right. Uh, for example, I. Let me see. Show more. There was one time I had to, I was at a wedding and I just, just showing how we could write an MC script. So for example, I had to give it MC script for who and who, give it a bit of a context. So it will write in a bit, something a little bit more personalized. And something was wrong. They actually didn't fall in love at first sight, asked you to correct that, and now write that in Chinese. So I wrote that in Chinese and say, I'm the MC, I kind of, I'm not great at Chinese. I want to break it down line by line to say, write it in Han Yu Ping, but after yeah. each line in Chinese. That's really so good. Nice. You could, you could do that. That's what something, that's something that Google can't do. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. It okay. couldn't follow these specific <laughs> instructions to reiterate that process. All right. Anything so else you think people... Well. For example... Yeah, website copy or, for example, if you want to write a, a an email to somebody, you want it to phrase in a different way, you want it to sound apologetic or sound more formal. For example, if I wrote it this way and said, uh, make it sound more formal. This could apply to email or in this case, this is website copy. Or you could say fun things like write it in the style of Shakespeare. I don't know if it's appropriate here. Sometimes it fails because the topic just isn't suitable for Shakespeare. Yeah, in this case, it kind of works. Hark, live photography does bring up excitement. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, you know, what, one, of the, one of the things I've seen people do with this technology is write songs. I mean, not just the lyrics, yeah, yeah. but yeah. also the melody. So that must be another engine, right? Yes. When... Yeah. Uh, no, it kind of has seen this and it, basically it's, well, it has seen notes before. So for example, uh, write uh, melody, and it, it may fail at first, okay? So I'm going to just test it first for, uh, well, first write lyrics. Write lyrics for, uh, Song about uh, parkour. I don't know. I can't think of that. Uh, about parkour for kids. <laughs> Keep it short. <laughs> oh, God. 
Okay, uh, now write the chords for this song. I don't know if you can do it, but... Oh, it does. So, you could literally plug this to a music engine and get it to play it for you. Hmm. Sounds fun. Maybe that's what I should I'm release. I'm pretty sure that there are music... <laughs> I'm pretty sure that there are already music sites out there which allows yeah. you to input text like chords and, and, and just plays it up for you. Hmm. Yeah, there must be some... i got to check out this kind of music generation AI. Um, okay, there cool. Are, there are tons of it. There, there are right. tons of it. Let, just, let me just jump to... Let so, me just jump to a, a, a list of different types of AI. Okay. So there are actually many different AI tools. Uh, this website is called Futurepedia. The last check has got, uh, the last I check has got 700, now it's got 1,000. There's a lot of being added every day. Uh, but you see they're, they're kind of arranged in a couple of different types. There are text tools, there are image tools, uh, not as much audio tools, but hey, guess what happens when you have a lot of images that just, tweaks a little bit from each other into 30 frames and you have uh, one second of video. You add in audio and then you have video. Hmm. So there are already video tools out there, and just not as refined yet. It just takes time for it to improve to be able to generate a full new audio tool for you. Uh, and then different verticals as well, anywhere from fun tools to educational tools to business tools to research tools. Wow. Okay, so can visit this degree. website to get access to all these different tools and explore them. Yeah, just to explore the different tools. And a lot of the job, remember this, it only came into at least public awareness uh, since November last year. It's only been a couple of months. Uh, that means that the people who have just woken up to this idea, the money has just started pouring in, businesses are just starting to develop, and it takes a couple of months to, to generate that idea before they come on the website. So a lot more are just going to pour in. Yeah, yeah. Right now it's at a thousand. The, <laughs> and the reason I dated this uh, at the beginning of the slide is in, in a month's time, a lot of this information is going to be outdated. Yeah. And even false. <laughs> okay so obviously for business purposes it has a slew of can be used in so many different ways creating content of course is the most obvious mm -hmm. one marketing materials websites yeah. all that kind of stuff um what else can it can it write say you know there's a whole market out there on advertising yeah. on facebook and yeah. google and all that can it create good copy for yeah. that marketing Adver copy it's, it's great for it's great for advertising copy it's great for advertising copy and more so, especially generating ideas. So what you would, I would ask it to do is, rather than just generate an idea, give me 20 ideas for a Valentine's Day ad copy it for a... Uh, for a toy dog. For example, so this gives you ideas, and it, I could say, I like nine. Uh, give me more details on that. Wow! So it's good to okay, give so it's you like your personal. It's an agency in your pocket. <laughs> In a way, and, and, and the thing is, it, you, you could say, give me 200 ideas. There's no limit to that based on, well, there is a limit based on the number of tokens. Yeah, so I'm also thinking you for personal use. Or, yeah. It, it's great for coming up with ideas for presents or gifts for people. <laughs> yes. Give me 20 gift ideas for my wife's birthday. Uh, we give a bit of context. She likes nice stuff <laughs> like earrings, necklaces, but I don't want to give them.
that. Jewelry. Yeah, okay. What else? So the context is important. Otherwise, it, it kind of runs, it gives a very broad scope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By giving it context, it kind of, kind of helps you narrow things down. Wow. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's really useful. <laughs> um, yeah. All right, so yeah, great for generating ideas, whether it's for personal or for business. Um, mm -hmm. yep, yep. Okay, well, this is pretty. This has been super yep. interesting in terms yep. of we're yeah. Go. Let's talk a little bit about education since we're there. Education? So, okay, um, sure, sure. What What do you see in? Yeah. Okay, so there's a lot of controversy now, like like students doing. Handing up homework, and my kids are frequently told by the teachers, "Do not use Chat GPT." Really? Uh, but then there's another school of thought. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they warned that because it's easy to cheat, and they, they, a lot of if you overuse Chat GPT, the students can become lazy. And yeah, yeah, for sure. Start not to think about how they actually do things. However, on the other side of the the the, the, the thought process is that if you prevent them from using Chat GPT, it's it become, chat GPT in 10 years, when they start going to workforce, it's going to be so pervasive that if they don't use it at all, they're going to be totally handicapped. And you kind of need to know, you can't just, you kind of need to know how to use chat, chat GPT or other AI tools. And granted, in 10 years time, the AI tools will look very different, but you kind of need to know, you need to know how to use it effectively. People who know how to use it effectively will have a huge advantage over those who don't. So I've met a lecturer who says, hey, he's, he's a co he teaches programming and he tells his student, okay, feel free to use ChatGPT, but tell me how you used it. And the, you see that the, 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 the students think of it very differently and they kind of improves it and learns from how, uh, learns from examples ChatGPT gives them and knows that in this case, it's useful because it will have mistakes. And it kind of learns from how it gives mistakes and learns how to correct its mistakes as well. Yeah, I guess I guess yeah, that's the thing. How do we how do we harness the power of this without without um how do we utilize it without detracting or I don't know not abusing it? <laughs> well, first of all, a lot of teachers are starting to use use AI to mark the kid children's work. What? How do you use AI so to mark you can, uh, mark work? Yeah, for example, you could say uh you so for what I'll do is I would give it. Oh, a, you can put you can put param you can basically copy and paste the student's work and give parameters on how to mark it. Yes. Yeah, English <laughs> teacher with thirty years experience, and you could create this prompt and you can save this prompt. So I tend to have a, a, a kind of a key note, or you can use an extension to look at other people's prompts or save your own prompts. Uh, give me a table of how the follow the provided text below can has mistakes mistakes and how it can be improved so, and what I usually like to do is to actually show what table is. So, for example, sentence, uh, mistake, correction. And then you paste whatever it is up there and let it generate that thing. Wow. So, you, you've actually I heard of teachers. To, for example, yeah, yeah, yeah. Teachers actually do that. And so, for example, uh, I just recently SEO my, uh, tried to create a page for SEO. And so, it's livestudios.com. And I want to SEO for Instant Prince Singapore. So the, the, the thing is, don't use it to create all the text for you. The problem is, once you take a look at AI-generated text, you kind of know that it's AI-generated. But what is great for you is generating ideas like this. So I'll get it to generate uh, things in point forms. And I'll just take the headers. And then I'll rewrite this whole thing myself. Okay. Because if you just copy straight from Chat GPT, AI detectors will soon catch up. And how, eventually how, how, do, how do they detect how do they know? How do how do AI detectors work? How can it tell if, if it's Okay, so first of all it's a cat it's a, it's a cat and mouse game. So currently the way AI 
writes it, it's uh, it's it's got a certain pattern. It's very. Uh, let me just show you the prompt that's used to bypass that currently. So if I look at my AI collection and I search for burstiness, right. So, so for example, I would give it this prompt. When it comes to writing content, two factors are crucial. So in this case, this is this is called priming. It is to teach it something that it doesn't know. In this case, because Chat GPT was, uh, it doesn't know anything before it became popular. There isn't this information, so we kind of teach it this information and prime it uh, so that it can give it the results that we want. So it say it gives it an idea of what perplexity and burstiness is. Perplexity measures the complexity of text. Burstiness compares the variations of the sentences. Humans tend to write with greater burstiness. For example, and therefore I need you to write it with a good amount of perplexity, perplexity and burstiness. And then using the concepts written previously, rewrite this article with a high degree of perplexity and business burstiness and it paste it on. Now the problem is the AI detectors will then catch on to this soon. And then it becomes a cat, and they're kind of a cat and mouse game. They're chasing each other, and eventually you may not be able to tell very well. Uh, eventually, kind of even out. But you kind, I, for now, I can, I can sense, I can look at a text. I, I'll know it's AI. But eventually, okay. it may not be that clear. So right now, it's probably still better to try and personalize it and rewrite it, just to avoid being um, penalized in the search engines for this kind it. of stuff. Hmm? I will still do it. Yeah. Yeah. So there, are, there are kind of different kinds of AI detectors available. This is uh, one of the content detector. Uh, it may not. I, I've tested a few. They're all not accurate. Some of the best ones may be paid. Uh, let me see. There are. There was a list of AI detectors. I can't remember where it was now. But look for look for a list of AI detectors. This is the one that's free and it kind of works somewhat. You copy and paste. Actually, I haven't tested my site. Let me. Why don't we try it now? So, if I copy, for example, this set of information, I copy and paste it in here. Check. So, in this case, yes, I passed it well. But in other AI detectors, it kind of fails. And that's because all I did was I kind of looked at I, the, the things I copied were the headings, and some of it I changed, even changed the, the ideas for the headings and rewrote the whole text itself. Then, why do you think? Uh, why do you th my, Why do you think there's yeah, been ahead. all these services for AI detectors spring up? What what value or what's the demand there for something like this? Is it is it just a huge for, demand? Because if you realize, because this tool is available for everybody to use now. Every SEO company, every Tom, Dick, and Harry are going to use it to write their content. The internet will be flooded and diluted with these content. And frankly, if it's written by AI, it's going to be, it's going to sound good, but it's actually very poor quality content. Okay. So it's mainly just to try and clean up the SEO so, or make the SEO still relevant and not be kind of well, swamped it's not by only all this. SEO, there, are, there are people who have kind of detecting whether resumes that are submitted are written by AI or written by themselves. Um, teachers would obviously use it. There are people who will fact check the information to see if it's written by a human, vetted by a human or just really written. There, there, people could write bots to just generate articles and articles without even checking. Yeah, I'm just when, when we're just talking about this, it just makes me think like the next 10, 20 years, it's all about trying to work out what's real and what's fake. <laughs> it's gonna that's yeah, gonna be such there, a big, there's big a issue. Lot of, there's gonna be a lot of things. And let's okay, but why not, since we're on the topic of fake information, uh, let's talk about fake information now. Uh, for example, where fake information, I can't remember where, um, GPT 4. For example, this this was when GPT was went viral. Um, there's this chart that was very popular. It says that hey, G GPT three has 175 billion parameters and GPT four has 100 trillion parameters, and this has been talked about and retweeted countless times. So to a autocomplete engine, it will take this and you kind of repeat it. It kind of mimic what it has seen before. 
However, this was fake information and it's even Sam Altman, the founder of ChatGPT, has come out and said this is bullshit. So in true in reality, it's going to rather than having a five hundred times increase, it's more likely going to have a a, a five times increase for GPT four. Hmm. And there are tons of this information who will be which will be uh, there's going to be a lot of false information. False information is going to be amplified as well. So yeah. the verification engine is going to be useful in that case to be able to verify this engine and give it a kind of a rating to say this is two uh, percent true, and kind of gives you an indication of what's true or not. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> God, it's getting complex. <laughs> It, it, um, it gets very, very complex. Right. So anyway, going back to that, the, the topic of education. So your, your basic take on it is yes. that we need to educate people on how to use it. And having yes. that teacher as an example, that's really good. The teacher actually wants to know how you used it. So we're talking about understanding and being clever about how you use the technology to create whatever you're doing. Yes. So the focus needs to be there. Yes. Um, at least you need to you need for them to it could be a, a kind of a extracurricular activities on how to use chat GPT and when not to you, the schools would probably it's probably a good idea for schools to say if you use chat GPT make, if you use any AI make sure you specify how you used it hmm hmm Just so what do, you th- what, 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 what do you think what do you think what do you what's that if, just like if you if you copy images or quote a text from somewhere, you kind of you need to specify where your sources are. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, just giving credit where it's due. Now, going forward, yeah. what what do you think? A um, is what do you think the roadmap is going forward for the next year or two? And where do you think are the areas that people need to start taking advantage of this technology? and uh, harnessing its power. Okay, so this is a sigmoid curve, and it's usually used to represent technologies whereby they usually start off very slow, and then mm. it'll take off, and then after some time, they kind of plateau up. The, the, the problem is, nobody really knows at which point of this curve AI is on right now. So has it been in the past 50 years, and then deep blue is here, and we're at the top of the curve, or are we just really at the beginning? Uh, I think we're just really just at the beginning and in the next 10 years, it will just shoot up by a lot. Uh, NVIDIA agrees with me and it says that in 10 years, ChatGPT will be a million times more powerful. That is actually possible. I don't see it as, as, as too far off. Because if you think of it, the way technology is done or programs are written now, they are written by humans. Uh, the, the vaccines are currently created mostly by humans. Um, if AI now starts coming into it, and think of how vaccines are created. Vaccines are created by somebody saying, uh, by educated people guessing and say, okay, let's try this, let's try that, and then test it and say, this doesn't work. Uh, let's think of more permutations to test. AI is great at permutations. It'll just say, come with this whole list of permutations, now send to all the researchers around the world and let's eliminate the permutations and figure out what works and what doesn't work and generate these ideas. And, and that speeds up vaccine research by a whole lot. Um, it, it comes with a lot more things as well. Programming, for example, and if, if this becomes a lot more powerful, programmers will not need to actually do the programming. They'll be stepping one level ahead. Uh, interestingly, let me, let me jump to this. This is There's this guy that posted a video about if chat GPT will replace programmers. So I looked at the video and, and kind of commented, I don't know how many times I shook my head because it's like criticizing a first grader who number one, has been given a lot of books to learn programming that's the knowledge that is searched, but it's got not had the ability to look at new books, so it's limited to 2021. Any new code has not had a chance to look at it. It can't even ask for opinion. So it's based on, it, it's gone for, it's listened to a lot of lecturers, but it hasn't gone for any tutorials whereby you've got a lect- teacher there who tells you to correct those mistakes. And it doesn't have access to a machine to test that code out. 
Now, what, what happens when it does that? And interestingly, the guy who wrote that says that's a pretty good analogy. So it, it will really jump quite a bit to improve its intelligence you know, when it has new training data, when it has the ability to search out for new information to verify its data, and when it has the ability to have a feedback loop. Right now, it doesn't have that feedback capability. Hmm. So, so, so in, what do we what case, do we need uh, to start doing? <laughs> okay, first you need to understand. So you need to understand what it can do. Uh, let's look at one thing I have: winners of AI. So before that, first off, there are two big winners of AI. Firstly, Microsoft has done a very smart investment in in, in open AI. So every all the profits now, 75% goes back until it recoups the $10, $20 billion. Uh, and then after that, it owns 49% of OpenAI shares. NVIDIA is the company that creates all the GPUs that's used to, for AI. Of, obviously, they're Chinese competitors now. But what's important is actually us. Uh, a lot of experts and people who are watching this will agree that if you don't use AI, you will fall back a lot because AI, even as of now, improves your productivity by at least five times to 10 times. It speeds up programmers, it speeds up copywriting, it speeds up idea generation, it speeds up ad companies' um, generation of text or ideas to present to customers. So at this point in time, it's just a five to 10 times increase. In five to 10 years' time, it will be a whole lot more. So for people who are skeptical of AI or in fear of AI taking over the world, the point is it will eventually do it. Uh, it's just whether it's used for, the, for, for evil or whether it's used for good. And that's Elon Musk's idea as well. Eventually, AI will surpass human intelligence. And it it's, becomes very scary when it does that because there are a lot of doomsday scenarios and all that. And the only way for us to combat that is if we ourselves uh, improve it. For example, integrating ourselves with AI. So, uh, for example, this is brain enhancement. So this is a video. Okay, you can't hear, can you see the video? Yep, well, I can't hear it. Do you hear the video? Okay. Can you hear that? Nope. You're gonna have to send it to me. Okay. So, uh, I'll summarize this for you, and I'll send it to you later. What what it essentially says is this is about brain implant technology and what it could do. So eventually, the brain is just essentially electric signals that's that's sending it to each other. And researchers have already found how to create sight for blind people. Right now, it's a bit blurry, but it could create a kind of approximation of where things are. Over the years, it will improve. And eventually, you could literally watch a video in your brain, literally. Um, and it could it has the power to enhance thinking. So, for example, right now, our calculator is external. You could literally embed a calculator into your brain. You could embed coding engines into your brain. You could embed literally whatever you want to. You can literally embed it into your brain in the future, and that would significantly enhance our capability, and that will give us at least a fighting chance against AI, or at least have the ethics to be able to control it. I guess that's what Elon Musk's uh, Neuralink is all about, huh? It is. It is. This is exactly talking about what. Uh, and that's Elon Musk's initial main concern. It, he is worried about AI because he, we can see the potential of it. There's a uh, thought. There's a, there's a there's a thought called the singularity. And the singularity is the point whereby AI's intelligence matches humans human intelligence. And when it happens to that point, AI could literally create new machines, create new AIs, and we will. At, at this stage, we kind of provide safeguards and provides ethics to say, you should do this, you shouldn't do this, and all that. If when AI rewrites its engines, it may not include those safeguards. 
So that becomes a scary point. And Elon Musk's point is, in order to fight that, we need to be able to have that kind of capability as well. Hmm. So uh, in, the, in 10 years' time, you're going to have one of these little things in your head. <laughs> I don't know how long. It could be 10 years, it could be 20 years, uh, but eventually we will have it. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, unless something else destroys the whole world before that. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. That's a, that's a, that's well, the future a is scary. The future is scary. The future is scary, but I, yeah. I think we've got to kind of prepare ourselves for that. Eventually, people who are, who are using it for evil will advance AI. Yeah, yeah. So it's just about a matter and of uh, people using it for on good. the good side using it more effectively or yeah. better. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So basically, I think the key thing is got to start getting on top of this AI stuff now, start investing time learning about it and trying to get gain some kind yeah. of uh, hold. You, you need to understand it. You want to. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so you need to understand the, the thing is in 10 years time or five years time, we won't be using the car, this current version, but by the time a new version comes out and you, when you try to catch up with it, you're already lagging behind those who have already had the foundation for the, for the previous version. Yeah. So now's the best time to get on, get onto this. Um, so basically everything yeah. that you've shared, I'll include in the links below so we can get quick access, mm -hmm. including yeah, yeah. some of the videos that. Uh, I want to show you something as well. You, okay. Yeah, I want to show you something as well. Initially, you asked if about day-to-day -day use and for non-programmers. So what I did was, remember the software, software, where was the software thing? Yeah, let me find it. Software automation part. So I there, there, there are other kinds of software, like for example, this Google Sheets, this is Adobe Photoshop, and this is OBS Studio. But... I'm familiar with these. I picked one that I'm not familiar with, like Blender. I installed Blender and see if I can, I'm not that familiar with Python, and I see if I could do something with it as an experiment. So this is Blender. I would, this is the scripting portion of it. I would just so it's a 3D, create- 3D software. Uh, yeah, it's a 3D software. And eventually yeah. it, you could, remember it's a 3D software and eventually you could animate the 3D software and it becomes a video. Right, okay. In fact, there are lots of videos that have been created by Blender, but AI is not advanced at this stage to create it using code. Most of the um, videos so far created by Blender has been done by hand and not by code, so AI hasn't learned how to do that yet. Okay, so what have you done here? You've actually okay, so written what some did, code? Okay. Yeah, so what I've done is I've asked a uh, chat GPT to create a 3D model of a solar system. Now, my first, my, my first prompt that I gave it was to give it relative sizes and accurate distances and realize that that totally failed because the, this, the planets are so far away from each other and the sun is so much bigger than Pluto or, or Mercury that you can't even see it. So I regenerated the prompt and, and, and I tried to do it, but it kind of remembered the first version. I couldn't forget it. So I had to recreate a new chat to start from fresh. So instead of, like this is a negative prompt, don't use the actual sizes of the planets as you will create too much difference and difficult to see. And make sure that the smallest planet is 20% the size of the sun. Uh, and I should include the sun as its first value. And initially it created a problem with the code because they tried to include colors using old code and a new code gave errors. So I said, Okay, to make it simple, remove the colors, and I want to give it names instead. And then it generated this bit of code. Okay, I copied this bit of code, and I plugged it, pasted it in, and ran the code, and it generated this. Pretty okay for a couple of minutes of work, just to give it this bit of code. You did this in Blender. And a couple of, after an, How You did this, this in Blender. Blender, yes. So you copied yeah, this code, Blender. and you ran it in Blender. Using the scripting. Yes. You right. Copy it and paste. There's a scripting portion here. You press scripting, you press new, paste the code in, and run. And then it just automatically creates it. Wow. And that Because normally, it. of course, that would take okay. hours yeah, well, to try and draw up. <laughs> yeah. And you notice it takes the in the relative size, it kind of adjusts the sizes as well. 
rather than taking actual relative size, which will make mercury too small, it mm -hmm. makes mercury 20% as, as what I asked it over here. It's 20% of what uh, compared to the sun. And okay, but then I, again, now we have got problem because the sun is the same size as Jupiter. Yeah. So then what did you do in the next one? I saw the other one had the rings of... Yeah, so I kind of spent another hour to kind of try to improve this to say, hey, I want to add rings on some of the planets. The sun should be bigger than Jupiter. So there are a couple of iterations of the prompt to correct this. Uh, okay. But eventually, the code became way too complex that it, and it doesn't improve much beyond that point that I just gave up after this. Okay. okay. But I learned a couple of things from this. So I learned that after some time, the code kind of messes up and you kind of need to start from scratch and you need to kind of give it a prompt to start. So I kind of came out of this prompt to say your expo coder, this is a standard so I, primer. I, I got to ask a question. Uh, why, is it, why is it always 30 years experience? Uh, it could be any number, but just to give it an idea that is, is very experienced. Okay. Okay. So, and I want to give it a couple of rules of how I like to write the code. And, and these are the kind of the rules I give it. And then I would then copy my, every time I had a, a successful version, I would then copy that and I'll paste it into a notepad somewhere. In this case, I'm using Google Keep. So I've got a Google Keep for a, a kind of a rules for a generic rule prompt for any coding that I use and a version of the code that worked. And whenever right. it messes up the code and it doesn't give me what I want, I'll go back, I'll copy this section which primes it and copies this code and ask it to study this following code just to give it a reset based on the, the previous version that worked. All right. Okay, so, yeah. and you can do this for your anything that you do as well. You you kind of this kind of works and before it messes up, you kind of save that information and it can kind of save the prompt that has worked so far. Right. So that's good. So save prompts that work for you and also save the results that are good for examples. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's good. Okay. Uh and I kind of learned a couple of things from here as well. After a while, it, the project gets very big and every time you ask it, you don't want it to regenerate the whole chunk for you. So you break the projects into smaller chunks and I'll ask it to give it numbers. For example, I'll ask it to put, give numbers in a comment so that I can refer to it and say, okay, rewrite function two instead of rewriting the whole stuff because I don't need the whole stuff. I only need to change function two. Uh, you need to learn this new, the nuances of what it can do, what it can't do. You have an idea of where its memory limit is and where it forgets things. And when it forgets things, you may need to repeat the prompt. You save the progress externally in a notepad or something and tell it what doesn't work. You can use negative prompts to... So yeah. every time it's something, I will probably add a negative prompt onto the initial prompt to, to help prime it better. Cool. So I guess this is, yeah, yeah, so this is specificity and, and this is, is, this is super important. This could be done by people. Yeah, and this could be done for people who don't know much coding at all. This I this is a, a little bit more of a complex example. And this is because I understand coding. I got it a little bit further than what somebody who hasn't uh, managed to do it before. But even if you don't understand code, you could ask it to do very simple things. You can just need to copy and paste it in. If it gives an error, feed the error to chat GPB and let it figure out something. If it doesn't work, you ask it to regenerate response and test these different versions of it. So even a non-coder could do a, a very simple things. Hmm. And there are other hmm. ways for, for it as well. For example, you could re-edit the previous prompt to ask it to save and resubmit it for you. Or when it doesn't work, you just create a new chat and repaste in your prompt, repaste in the version that worked. Yeah. It sounds like it's a really good tool as well. Just if you're learning programming, it can give you ways it's like good. Yeah, it's it good. gives you a, a yeah. answers, specific answers to whatever problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah. yeah. Super useful. It, and it's not limited to programming. It's just what I find it very useful for because I, my programming is rusty. My programming knowledge is 20 years old. I used to be a programmer before, but I don't know any of the new languages. Uh, and I, and it probably showed me new ways of doing things that I wouldn't have thought of before. Hmm. That's very good. All right. So 
Okay, cool. That's a, I think that's been a pretty good overview of this new technology, where it can, yeah. where it's going, and where it's at right yeah. now. Um, so I'll guess I'll just yeah. get. Um, we'll include all the links that Willie shared to the videos, to mm -hmm. some of the resources, um, to hopefully get you started on the AI journey. And um, I yep. guess if you have any questions, please pop them in the comment center below, and then we'll try and answer them. I'm sure this is going to get more interesting as this conversation goes. I'm going to certainly have a lot of questions after I go and have a play with some of these new tools. I'm <laughs> it is. It is. I'm it's surprised. Really you fun. Have... It's going to be fun. It's going to be frustrating as well. Fun and frustrating. <laughs> it's going to be fun and frustrating. Yeah. That's good. Managing expectations. You need, you're going to work. On it. Yeah, you need, you work at something and you kind of figure out why doesn't it give me the result I want. You need to kind of figure out how to engineer your prompt to tweak and massage the results. Hmm. All right. What's your, what's your next project? I mean, you've been working on your website, you're, you're working on some software and just playing. Is that that's the main thing right now for you? Well, okay. So the, the, I've, the code that I've written for my business is 20 years old and I haven't rewritten and because of, and I've, I've held it back because it's a huge endeavor to rewrite the entire code. And over the last few months or so, I've been just looking at, just testing a different parts of the code. For example, face detection. I've always wanted to have a way to uh, detect faces and it, it, it's a lot of homework to be done. And then all I need to do was to just ask, a, just ask chat GPT and it give a spit out an example code and say, okay, I know that's possible now. And I save that portion of the code. And then there are different bits of, uh, technology that I kind of want to implement, I'll just ask and I kind of save it and eventually I'll be able to piece everything together and work out a code and that will save me at least 20 times the speed of what I would do if I were to do it myself and if I were to hire somebody else to do it, I want to control of the code and it can get quite messy as well. Yeah, exciting. All right, well, thank you very much, Willie. It's been very enlightening. And um, I'm sure we're going to be back on another call and then wow, delve deep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we're yeah we're going to do this again and get get deeper once uh, once I get a more handle on this technology. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sure in a month or two months time it'll be different. Yeah. Uh, and it'll be really exciting when I have my hands onto a Microsoft's version, the Bing version of uh, Chat. Uh, it's 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 probably included math logic. Uh, it's got logic in there. It's got a way of thinking, uh, and I don't know what else is included. Hey, just one other thing. Right now in the marketplace, there's just ChatGPT, and the kind yeah. of more commercialized version of it with Bing. Well, is there anyone else in the in the space right now? Yeah. So Google has this version of called Bard. Initially, it was hesitant to remove it because. Uh, it could get corrupted sometime. And that's why OpenAI has to introduce safeguards and it's got a kind of a memory limit because over time, uh, bad, act bad actors can literally teach AI. If, if it has a persistent memory, bad AI, act bad actors could literally corrupt it and teach it bad things. Just as you would teach a child bad things, eventually you'll corrupt its brain, which is why its brain is fixed and it's got a temporary memory of 4,000 tokens. Right. If it's got a persistent memory, somebody will find a way to jailbreak it and find a way to corrupt it. Gotcha. So what's Google's one called? It's called BARD, B-A-R-D. Okay. Meta's version is called Lambda, but it's not released to the public yet. Okay. And it's, uh, it's got a research version which has shown itself to be uh, a lot more efficient and much larger, or rather it's not large, so much larger, but it's a lot more efficient than chat GPT and therefore can handle more parameters. Right. And Google's one, you're saying it's currently operational? Uh, internally within BART, it's tried to do its launch and demo, which kind of failed really badly for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it didn't show anything new that chat GPT couldn't do. And because of that little one mistake about it, saying that James, uh, the, the the telescope did it first, did, has its first picture, that news went viral. 
Okay, but sounds... if you ask Chat GPT, Chat GPT would have probably made the same mistake. Right. Okay. But and it's... if you regenerate the font, it will, will show different answers. A different response may not have shown that same mistake. Right, right. So basically, um, that's not open to the public yet. So we're still waiting for the public releases of Bart and Lambda. Yeah. All right, cool. Yeah. So there, are off, cool. there are other AIs as well. There's from other smaller companies which you could find in the, uh, which you could find in the, the directory, the Futurepedia. Futurepedia. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Willie, again, for your time. It's been super educational. It's been fun. It's actually been quite fun working out these slides and I kind of learned a couple of new things. Like I was I was very interested in AlphaGo and Deep Blue and kind of learned a couple of new things about AlphaGo and all that. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's been fun. Working I think, yeah, I think the history is definitely very interesting. You've only yeah. given us a very, yeah. uh, a, a very intro to that, but yeah, definitely it'd be interesting to better understand the the progression over the last seven, 70 years. Wow. <laughs> it's been 70 years yes, in the making. In 10 <laughs> years, remember, remember the, 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 the chess example. In just 10 years, it has improved so much that nobody could beat AI from the time it has beaten the first uh, world chess, uh, highest ranking chess player to yeah. the point where nobody could beat it anymore. That's just in the span of 10 years. Yeah. <sighs> Crazy. No time. No time to waste. We got to get cracking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Willie. We'll catch you again right, soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll catch up again soon. Bye. Definitely. See ya. Hope you've enjoyed my conversation with Willie sharing all he knows about AI and ChatGPT. Do check out all the references made in the video with links in the description below, including the AlphaGo documentary that Willie mentioned and really recommends checking out. Other than that, you know the drill. If you like this video, please do like, subscribe, and hit that notification button so you don't miss any future videos from me. For any questions, comments, or suggestions, please hit me up in the comments section below. Thanks again for watching, and catch you in the next video. See ya.